Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. A few years back, on the second or third Saturday of February at Huntington Lake in Fresno County, in the distance, a loud howl-like sound was heard. At first, we thought maybe a bear had been hit by a car. Each howl lasted approximately 15 seconds. After the third or fourth time, another sound began echoing around the walls of the valley we were in. The closest thing I can think of is someone speaking backwards English through a megaphone. This lasted for around five minutes. The entire time, none of us could make out a single word. Yet, it sounded English. We basically figured that it was a crew of people looking for the animal making the first howl, even though it was obvious that the original sound came from miles away. The first howl sounded very similar to recordings I have heard of Bigfoot. As soon as the second sound began, a couple of dogs across the lake started barking. There were five of us sitting on lawn chairs around camp. There was no fire. It was around 11 p.m. And it was close to a full moon. The lake was frozen. And there was maybe three feet of snow on the ground. On to the next story. In June, at Bridge Camp or Stewart's Fork, near Wearyville in Trinity County, as my friends and I sat around our campfire about three miles from the trailhead at a flat, well-trampled site, we heard a group of low-based voices mumbling down the hill and breaking large sticks. When the voices drew closer to our camp, we heard them charge to a mere high-pitched tone, possibly surprised and uncertainty. Since it was spring, the river was swollen, and my companions dismissed the noises as something like stream gargle echo. But when it suddenly stopped, there was a great absence of sound, and the river couldn't reproduce the noise. I then witnessed large, tall shadows move through the trees and down the back of a flat granite riverbank. It was then that what I can only describe as a protest dance began. The Sasquatch began stomping with enough force to almost bounce me up and down on a log seat, and the chants grew loud, spirited, and quite hysterical. The seat I was on was a thick log supported on either side, about seven feet apart by other logs that literally bounced when the protest dance began. The message of their chant was unmistakable in any language. Get the bleep out. So much that I declared, whatever that is, it doesn't want us here. Let's just pack up and go. My friends, although visibly quite shaken, were still reluctant to concede our sight. Then abruptly, the chants actually shouts and screams stopped with a few deep hooted orders from what I believe to be the male, the pack of voices trailed off. I didn't relax again until I heard screams much later far up the valley and then from the mountaintop on the other side. Just passing through, I thought. Later, just after I had settled into my tent, my tentmate asked, Did you hear that? Even though I had my sleeping bag pulled back from my ears because I heard a shuffling in exactly the place he described, I replied no, hoping it would go away. I lay there on my back watching the fire's orange glow and then black. A silhouette had eclipsed our fire and was squatting in front of the tent. I caught a scream in my Adam's apple for fear. I might frighten the creature into who knows what. It was so close. I could feel its breath pushing against the nylon and a warm stench filling the air. 
five clear digits, groped at the zipper in curiosity. I could sense the way a German shepherd senses the fear of an adolescent that the Sasquatch knew that I knew he was there, and that I was literally scared pissless. I had to go before he arrived, but held it in all night. The shadow gave way to the familiar warm glow of the fire just as it had arrived. In the morning, I actually found some hairs, thin black hairs with silver tips, and a few deep potholes on the trail that were pushed in by something heavy. Before this encounter, I was a skeptic. Now I feel Dr. Krantz's idea of families is exactly what we encounter. I saw a documentary after this incident. I also feel I sensed the intelligence, compassion, and even mischievous sense of humor that these animals possess. Please don't take this as a joke. At least I believe every word of what I said. Yes, I do kick myself for not collecting the hair or photographing the intentions or even swallowing my fear and moving an inch to peek outside. I would like to say that I think it was a family of Bigfoot possibly migrating. They were definitely communicating with one another, even if it was only grunts. They got the point across. We had been sitting around the fire, roasting marshmallows, getting ready for bed. For springtime, the camp was extremely hard-packed earth. It was in a sort of clearing just above the river. On to the next story. Shortly after I graduated college, my best friend was a resident hall director at South Regina University. School had recently let out and all of the dorms were vacant. Late one night, she and I went through several of them as they had a history of being haunted. She had a master key that could get us into any building. The first building we visited was Cary Mansion, now called Seaview Terrace. As the resident director, she knew of a room in the building that they had to switch students out of three times that year due to claims of haunting. She challenged me to try to sense which room it was. The place is massive. We walked through for 15 minutes or so before I stepped into a back room on the second floor. I had a strange feeling and all the hair on my arms stood up. I announced that was the room and she nodded in confirmation. From there, we went to Williams Watt Sherman House. This dorm has had so much paranormal activity occur that the school has done several exorcisms on it. It was well after midnight. As we made our way inside, we were the only ones in the building, so we took our time and explored every room. Eventually, we found ourselves on the top floor and were at the end of a very long hallway. Suddenly, my friend and I both stopped in our tracks. We both turned around to look down the hallway at the grand staircase. She grabbed my hand and squeezed super tightly. A second later, a dark figure stepped off the staircase into the hallway. Much to my relief, the figure turned and walked away from us down the hallway before turning left and walking into a room. I took off, dragging my friend behind me and fled down the stairs before the figure reappeared. On to the next story. I don't smoke, yet often smell cigarette smoke that will linger when I'm alone. It has been happening for years. The last house I lived in, I could smell it in one area of my house. And it's odd as my partner doesn't smoke either. We recently moved to a new house. I have the smell often at the bottom of my staircase. It has even triggered my smoke alarm which is a free angel smoke alarm and is not faulty. I drive for a living and sometimes through the night, I will suddenly feel like I'm not alone and then smell cigarette smoke in the cab with me and it will remain for a while. On to the next story. There have been a couple of occasions when I have felt a little uneasy with no explanation. A group of us were in the grounds of Newstead Abbey, Lord Byron's home, 
on a night when the place was closed. We had heard that it was haunted, so we went to find out for ourselves. I had only walked for a short while, linking my friend's arm, when from nowhere a big cloud of thick white smoke quickly seeped upward from the ground a meter in front of us. We were terrified and turned running in the opposite direction. Our friends thought we were trying to scare them and didn't believe us. The second time it happened, on visiting my grandmother's grave, this time it was daytime and there was nothing eerie about it. The same white smoke rose up from the ground where she was buried. I was alone, but didn't feel as frightened as the time before, maybe because it was light. There were people walking around, and I had seen it before. I have no explanation for this, and I have no idea if others have seen the same thing, but I have a feeling it won't be the last time I see it. On to the next story. My husband and I went to Spain and both commented on the room not feeling right. It was as though we were being watched. I constantly had a bad feeling whilst in the room. We were glad it was a short weekend break as the second night we were both awoken by someone sitting on the end of the bed. There was no one there when we turned the light on. But... We both felt it. Neither of us slept well that night, and we were glad to check out in the morning. On to the next story. In 1998, I worked as a security guard at a local Christian college. The first night on the job, I was told it was my responsibility to patrol the campus all night, making sure the main doors were locked and to make sure that all the lights were off in the chapel. It was to be locked by 11 p.m., standard stuff. I started out walking around the campus, getting to know a few students, and just checking everything out. When 11 p.m. came, I went to the chapel and down to the basement first. Getting to the bottom stairwell door, I realized it won't open. I push on it four or five times, but the door seems locked. So, I go back up and out and to the back door. The basement is locked down, all the lights out, and it's secure. I go over to the stairwell door, and it opens easy for me from the outside. I figure it's just how the door is made. I go back upstairs and to the stage where the light switches are. I look up and I see what looks like a kid in the balcony. I yell for him, but he doesn't answer. Oddly enough, when I get up there, I can't find him. I get creeped out, but I figure it's late and I'm just seeing shadows. I go back down, cut all the lights, and lock up the chapel. At 3 a.m., I go out for the full campus rounds just to check on everything. Heading across the quad, I notice that the lights are on in the basement of the chapel, as well as the front spotlight. I go to the basement back door and find it's still locked. I go in, cut the light, and as soon as I do, I hear a long, loud bang in the stairwell. I run in there and up the stairs, thinking I'm chasing someone. But there is no one anywhere. I go back down and leave the back door and lock it. As I walk around, I notice the spotlight is off. I check to see if it could be motion control, but it's not. Since it was my first night, I decided not to say anything. The second night changed that. I again had weird experiences around the chapel. But on night two, I heard weird crying and sounds in the woods on the northern side of campus. I also saw two strange hooded teens down on the southwest side near where the tennis courts are. I tried to get close to them, but it always seemed like they were consistently moving 20 or 30 yards away from me. The next shift I worked, I decided to ask the guy who hired me about the strange happenings. He said that one of the other guards would drop by and basically debrief me. The guard who showed up was around 300 pounds of pure muscle, a Cherokee beast of a man. 
I told him everything, and he said, Yup, that sounds about right. He then proceeded to tell me that everyone who had worked there overnight had some odd experiences. He said that the stairway doors do not lock, but that he himself had spent 40 minutes one night locked between floors. He told me that he had thrown all of his weight against both doors, but they wouldn't move. And that each time he tried, he would hear this crazy laughter. He said he had chased what he thought were teens through the downstairs hall to watch them disappear. Another guard had walked into the chapel and stumbled on into what looked like a sacrifice with occult symbols drawn on the stage and had chased off people wearing cloaks only to find all evidence had disappeared. When he came back after trying to catch the cloaked figures, also the occult symbols were constantly being found on campus. Needless to say, I didn't stay there long. On to the next story. Hello friends, my name is Matthew and my story takes place in the rural town of Claremont, Wyoming. The year was 2014 and I was 26 years young. I worked as a bartender four nights per week and because of this I was fortunate enough to be presented with lots of interesting opportunities. If you're looking for a way to really get to know the locals wherever you live, spend some time bartending. You'll see what I mean. I met this middle-aged woman who I'll give the alias of Mandy. Mandy would come in from time to time and would be very flirtatious. She would also often talk about how her husband passed away a few years earlier and that her ranch home was far too big for the likes of her. I don't believe her place in Wyoming was her primary home as she seemed to be away for well over half of the year. One time she asked me about where I was living and I told her about my tiny one-bedroom apartment. She was pretty drunk at the time and made a big deal about it. She demanded that I move into her guest house. As soon as she told me it would be rent-free, I happily accepted the offer. The only duty I had while living there was to look after her cats when she was away. It seemed as though she had fired the last person to have had that responsibility just so that she could justify my move over there. I'll admit, Mandy was a bit creepy at times, but I dealt with it. It was an easy enough price to pay for no longer having the burden of worrying about making rent every month. Still, I got the impression that she might have been abusing alcohol along with other harmful substances. And this sometimes made her belligerent. She did seem kind of lonely, so I suppose I felt like I was doing at least a little bit of a good deed by socializing with her. I don't think even a week had gone by since I moved in over there when I stumbled upon something incredibly odd. The yard of the property was rather spacious, and when looking in pretty much any direction, you could find a trail or at least a clearing in the woods. It was a late summer day when I decided to go for a walk that I'd never forget. I remember I was listening to a podcast and admiring the scenery. Heading deeper and deeper into the woods, trying to become more acclimated to my new environment. Eventually, I made it over to what was essentially a valley in the middle of the forest. Though there were fewer trees in this valley than there were in the rest of the surrounding forest, there were still enough to give it lots of shade and keep it hidden from the hovering air traffic. There was something about this area that immediately caught my attention. There were structures made of branches, leaves, and moss scattered throughout the terrain. Although I didn't walk right up to them or anything, they were all large enough for multiple humans to fit comfortably inside. I came across this area around late morning. I know that because I remember that I had just had a cup of bulletproof coffee, 
which was a late morning ritual for me for years. At that time, I had no clue as to what I was looking at. I probably assumed it was a project done by the local Boy Scouts or something like that. What I did know was that I had an awful feeling while standing there, and I felt like many sets of eyes were on me even though I was unable to see a single soul. There was no noise of any kind, in fact. It was so unusually silent that I could hear the sounds of my increased heart rate. However, shortly after that, I was disturbed by the sound of footsteps coming from somewhere behind me. When I turned around, I couldn't believe what I saw. A large elk with about half of its skin torn off slowly hobbled past me, about 50 yards in the distance. But that wasn't even the most shocking part of it. What followed behind the severely injured elk was what at first looked like a couple of gorillas. They were both very dark and moved across the forest floor on both their back feet and knuckles. They seemed to be maintaining a distance as they observed the wounded animal, waiting for it to die. I was so frightened by the sight that I turned and ran as fast as I could back to the guest house. Every so often, I would look over my shoulder but fortunately, it seemed that nothing was interested in following me. I don't know what those things were, or if they were affiliated with those tree structures, but they scared the daylights out of me. I've read a lot of material on the topic, and I think it's safe to assume that what I saw was a couple of Sasquatch. I didn't tell the homeowner about what I saw that day, mainly because I didn't want her to think she was renting the guest house to a nutcase. I did live at that place for a considerable amount of time, but I never again saw a Sasquatch. There were times in the middle of the night where I heard strange noises, but I can't say whether they were affiliated. Thanks for allowing me to share my story. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!